Hello, and welcome back to Principles of Accounting 2. I'm your host, Dr. B. We are in the third week of Principles of Accounting 2 here at UMGC. And in this week, we will be introducing the topic of managerial accounting and job order costing. Managerial accounting is what this entire course focuses on. As you recall, financial accounting has to do with the financial statements, the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, statement of retained earnings. Those four financial statements are released to the external stakeholders of a company. Managerial accounting focuses on reports for managers that use are used for managing the company as it relates to things like cost, and understanding the overall financial health of the company from an internal perspective. Okay. So managerial accounting, what is it? It's the process uh, where decision makers are allowed to set and evaluate business goals by utilizing internal information to better understand how the company is functioning from an internal perspective and how to communicate that information to its stakeholders. A couple of differences between financial accounting and managerial accounting. Uh, financial accounting, which is what uh, Accounting 220 focused on, the users were external, primarily stakeholders, regulators, creditors, so forth and so on, people outside of the company. The types of reports we, dis we discussed in financial accounting were the income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, the statement of uh, retained earnings, owner's equity, so forth and so on. The frequency of those reports were published monthly, quarterly, and annually. This is where your 10K project comes into play. The 10K report is an annual report published by publicly traded companies to the Securities Exchange Commission. And within that report, we find all of the financial accounting information because it is released to external users like you, like me, like the government. The purposes are for external stakeholders to make decisions on investing, crediting terms, and other decisions. The external reports follow the generally accepted accounting principles as they're published and are monetary in nature. These are also audited by external companies, external CPA firms, namely the big four, KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, and a few others. That's all financial accounting. Managerial accounting focuses on the internal users, like managers, officers, other employees. Uh, now, one of the biggest differences between financial and managerial accounting are the types of reports that are generated. In managerial accounting, we look at things like job order cost sheets, which we'll discuss today, cost of goods manufactured, production cost reports, sales reports, forecasting, budgets. These are all internal reports. They are not released to the public. They are not released to external stakeholders. They are very heavily guarded internally. The frequency of these reports are as they're needed. And they are used to assist managers in decision making. They uh, are related to departments within a company, sections of the business, uh, and are very detail oriented as it relates to generally accepted accounting principles. And, and it's, there are no generally accepted accounting principles restraints. What that means is internal reports, managerial accounting does not follow general accepted accounting principles because that information is used internally. 
uh, and there are no independent audits done on managerial accounting reports because it's internal. Now, one thing I want you to do is to get your mindset in the place of a manufacturer. Manufacturing has to do with the production of finished goods. Uh, for example, in this example, we are a guitar manufacturer. As a guitar manufacturer, we process raw materials uh, by cutting, assembling, and it ultimately becomes a finished good. So with respect to manufacturing, it's important to understand how manufacturing works. It all starts with a customer order. A customer places an order with a company. The company purchases raw materials. In our example, a guitar manufacturer, we purchase wood, which is lumber. Uh, we purchase bridges, string, uh, other materials used in making a guitar. Once the manufacturer has received the raw materials, the raw materials come out of raw materials inventory and put into what we call work in process inventory. Work in process simply means we are in the process of manufacturing a finished good. Work in process for our company involves cutting the wood, assembling the neck and the body and putting on the strings and you know putting it all together right that's what assembly is once the work in process is complete we take the inventory out of work in process and put it into finished goods and the finished goods are then sold to the customer they're delivered to the customer at which point the customer pays us for the delivery of the finished goods. And that is, as you know, revenue. And the process is cyclical. It, it continues like that. Understanding costs is absolutely critical to this course. And of course, very, very important to any business we must understand what is cost, what it takes, what is cost, right? A cost is a sacrifice to obtain some benefit. That's nice. A cost is simply this. It takes resources to do anything in business. It takes resources. Those resources have a cost associated with them, a monetary cost. And we are concerned about monetary cost in this course. And of course, in, in business in a general sense. Managerial accounting, which is what this course is all about, has to do with how we record cost, how we track cost, how these costs are classified. And uh, understanding cost is very, very important to any business because we as business managers try to do our best to minimize cost and maximize profit. That is the whole idea of any business, right? And so uh, we identify, we the first thing we want to do is classify costs. We do this through what we call a cost object. A cost object is where we classify costs by the relationship to a segment of operations. <laughs> An example of a object cost would be a product, you know, finished good, a sales territory, a department, an activity, res uh, like research and development. Uh, these are all cost objects. They are related to the segment of an operation of a business, right? So a cost object could be a finished good. It could be a sales territory, a department, an activity. Activities are activities within the business. Uh, in our example, 
we have two uh, activities within the work in process department. We have um, we have the cutting and the assembly. Cutting wood is an activity. Assembling the guitar neck to the guitar body and putting all the facets on, that is also an activity. So those could be considered what we call cost objects. There are two types of cost. There are direct costs and indirect costs. Direct costs can be directly traced to the cost object. If a guitar is a cost object, that is our finished good, right? If a guitar is a cost object, the direct costs associated with that guitar are the wood used, the string, the direct labor, which are the people working on the guitar, make on the assembly line and the cutting department. All of those are direct costs. We can trace those costs to the finished good. That is what makes a direct cost. An indirect cost are costs that cannot easily be traced to a cost object. Not easily traced. Factory overhead, for the most part, cannot be directly traced to a finished good. A production supervisor's salary would be considered an indirect cost. The reason for this is the salary cannot be directly traced to an individual guitar. The production supervisor is oftentimes not physically touching the guitar in the manufacturing process. They're a supervisor. So they supervise the individuals who are working on the assembly process. Individuals working on the assembly process, their wages are direct costs because they are directly working on those, on those products, on those finished goods. Individuals who are not directly working on with the finished goods, their, their salaries are indirect costs. They cannot be directly traced to any individual guitar. So looking at uh, this graphically, we have raw materials. Uh, those costs of the raw materials are a direct cost because they make up the majority of the cost of the finished good, which is the cost object, right? So raw materials like wood, string, uh, facets, those are all raw materials that make up the majority of the cost of a finished good, in this case, a guitar. So raw materials are a direct cost. Direct labor is also a direct cost. Direct labor simply means the individuals working directly in the manufacturing process. Whereas uh, indirect costs would be things like the production supervisor. You can see from this image, the supervisor with a clipboard is not directly touching the manufacturing process. They are supervising individuals that are uh, directly in the process, right? So the supervisor who is not involved in the manufacturing process, but is indirectly involved, their salary would be considered an indirect cost. So uh, one thing to take away from this image is those four individuals that are on the assembly line they're, they are direct labor. They are a uh, direct cost because they are directly involved in the process. Indirect costs are things that are not directly involved in the process, such as a supervisor salary. So 
In classifying a direct or an indirect cost, we need to understand if that cost is traceable to the product. So first, we, first thing we do is we identify the cost object, in this case, the finished good, the guitar. Second thing we do is determine if the cost can be traced to the cost object, in this case, finished good. If it's traceable, it's a direct cost. If it's not traceable, it's an indirect cost. Traceable simply means, is it a majority cost associated with the total cost of the product? As I had said earlier, in this course, we are in managerial accounting, right? In this course, we are very concerned with cost and understanding cost, calculating cost, allocating cost, right? And so to do that, we are focusing on manufacturing because manufacturing involves a lot of different costs. So think of uh, your favorite product. Let's say it's a coffee mug. Okay, I like coffee. So let's say it's a coffee mug. In your coffee mug, uh, which is your favorite product, there are costs associated with manufacturing that coffee mug. There are direct materials, there's direct labor, and there's factory overhead. Direct materials cost would be, for a coffee mug, would be like the porcelain, um, the, uh, the handle, um, so forth and so on, right? Those are direct materials. They make up the majority cost of the coffee mug. The direct labor cost would be the individuals making the coffee mugs on the assembly line. And uh, factory overhead costs are costs that are indirectly related to the manufacturing process, um, so, such as the electricity to keep the lights on in the factory. That is part of factory overhead cost. But direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead, those three things together equal the cost of a finished good. So looking at our earlier example, as a guitar manufacturer, we have direct materials, which is the wood, the string, the, the metal facets, the direct labor, which is the individuals physically touching and working on the assembly process, and factory overhead, which is where the product is being made. It, it includes the costs with factory overhead include things like uh, insurance for the building, the lights, the rent, um, things like that, right? Those are all factory overhead parts. And those three together, direct materials plus fact, direct labor plus factory overhead equal the total cost of a product. Let's take a deep look at each one. Direct materials. Direct materials are the materials that make up the bulk cost of the finished good. It's an integral part and significant portion of the total cost. In our earlier example of a guitar, the majority cost of manufacturing a guitar include things like wood. Uh, other examples would be things like electronic components for a television. Electronic compo components make up the majority cost of television and manufacturing. Silicon wafers for microcomputer chips, uh, tires for an automobile, so forth and so on. These make up majority cost, right? Therefore, they are considered to be direct materials. With respect to direct labor, direct labor is said to be the majority cost for the individuals that are uh, part of the manufacturing process. Their wages make up the majority cost of a product. So direct, direct, anytime you hear direct labor, think the people working on the assembly process. They are the people on the front line, as we say. Uh, they are the assemblers, they are the manufacturers, the individual people working on, on assembling the product. Examples of this 
looking at our earlier example of the guitar manufacturer, wages of those employees that are cutting the raw materials and assembling the guitars, their wages are direct materials. Or, I'm sorry, direct, direct labor. Uh, other examples would include mechanics for, for repairing automobiles, machine operators for manufacturing tools, assembler, assembly wages for, for assembling laptop computers, you go on and on. But anytime you hear the word direct labor, automatically think these are the people that are working on the process of manufacturing a finished good, or they're doing something that involves the majority cost related to that finished good. Now let's talk a little bit more about factory overhead. Factory overhead costs are sometimes referred to as manufacturing overhead or factory burden. And these costs represent costs incurred in the manufacturing process that, are not, that do not include direct materials or direct labor. Examples of factory overhead would include things like the utilities for the factory, repairs and maintenance for factory equipment, property taxes on the factory buildings and land, insurance of factory buildings, depreciation of the factory uh, plant and equipment. All of these are indirect costs, but they are related to and incurred in the manufacturing process. Now that we have a better understanding of direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead, we can look at grouping these costs as they are related uh, to um, analysis and reporting. So there are two types of costs I want you to understand when it comes to analysis and reporting of things like direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. One is called prime costs. When you hear the word prime, think direct. Prime, think direct. When you hear prime costs, think direct costs. So this would include direct materials and direct labor. Conversion costs are costs that are converted in the manufacturing process. Examples of conversion costs would be things like the cost of converting materials into a finished good. Okay, this is where it gets a little muddy. Conversion costs. I'm converting raw materials into a finished good. There are costs such as a direct labor and factory overhead costs related to converting raw materials into a finished good because we have employees on the assembly line who are doing the wood cutting, doing the assembly. That's my direct labor people. They are a part of conversion costs because as the raw materials moves through the work in process to finish good, we are converting the raw materials into a finished good. And with that, we have individuals who are doing the converting, that's direct labor. And we also have factory overhead costs as a part of conversion costs. And the reason why factory overhead costs are part of conversion costs is we are using electricity in the manufacturing process. We are using utilities in the manufacturing process. We are using equipment in the manufacturing process. And we need to convert the cost associated with those things in factory overhead to the total cost of the product. And so that is why uh, um, factory overhead costs are, are conversion costs. Now, I had said that direct labor is both prime costs and conversion costs. Prime cost and conversion costs is direct labor. Now, here's a visual representation of this. Prime costs include direct materials, direct labor. Conversion costs include direct labor and factory overhead. Now, you're wondering to yourself, well, Dr. B, how could... Uh, 
direct labor would be both a prime cost and a conversion cost. Wouldn't that be double counting or something like that? Well, the answer is, is no. And here's why. Uh, direct labor, while yes, it is a prime cost, it is um, also a conversion cost because uh, part of the direct labor um, can be converted to the cost of a finished good. What do I mean by that? Well, if if it takes um, tw- if it takes five minutes to manufacture a guitar, I need to convert five minutes out of the full hour of wage for that employee to the co- total cost of a product. That's why it's both a prime cost and a conversion cost. Now that we've learned about um, direct and indirect costs and prime and conversion costs, there are two more types of costs I want you to understand. The first is called a product cost. Product cost is like saying the total cost of a finished good. That's a product cost. That would include direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. Direct materials, direct labor, factory over. That is a product cost. The other type of cost is called a period cost. A period cost would be selling and administrative expenses. Selling expenses would include things like marketing, uh, salespeople, salaries, delivering the product to the customer. Administrative expenses would include things like um, the accounting office, uh, the Um, administrative things, right? They're not directly related to manufacturing or selling. With respect to product costs, product costs ultimately become the cost of goods sold for a product. The cost of goods sold represents the total cost of a product. That's why we call it cost of goods sold. It becomes cost of goods sold when we sell the product. That is the total cost of the product, right? Period costs are normally, I I use the word normally loosely, are normally found on the income statement as an expense, okay? As an expense. That's why we call them period costs. They are accounting period costs. Selling administrative expenses, while they're related to the total cost of a product, they are indirectly related to the total cost of a product. And so that's why they are period expenses associated with the total cost of a product. And th- there, are, there are two methods that we use in allocating the period cost, and we'll talk about that shortly. So product cost and period cost. Examples. Product cost, direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. Direct materials, the wood to make a, a guitar. The direct labor are the individuals directly associated with making the guitar saw operator, assembly employees, so forth and so on. Those are the ones physically touching the manufacturing process. And we have factory overhead, guitar strings, general wages, uh, powder on the machines, depreciation expense, sandpaper, oil used in the, mach- in the machines, salary of production supervisors, so forth and so on. Those are all factory overhead. Direct materials plus direct labor, plus factory overhead equal the total manufacturing cost. Period costs, which are non-manufacturing costs, include selling administrative expenses, selling expenses, advertising, sales salaries, commissions, administrative expenses, office salaries, office supplies, depreciation expense. Okay. Product costs are reported on the balance sheet as inventory. Inventory, as you know, is a current asset of the business. Current assets are on the balance sheet. We have assets equals liabilities plus equity is the accounting equation. Assets, liabilities, and equity are on the balance sheet. On the income statement, we have income, which is revenue, 
and expenses, right? As the company sells finished goods, we take the finished good out of inventory, so off the balance sheet, and onto the income statement as a form of cost of goods sold. So the cost it took to make the finished good is our cost of goods sold. And it becomes a cost of goods sold when it's sold. Therefore, it winds up on the income statement. On the income statement, you have your sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus expenses equals net income. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second, but just to kind of give you an idea of how well detailed the income statement is. Period costs are reported as expenses on the income statement in the period of which they were incurred. So if I make a sale of uh, a batch of guitars in the month of September, then the related expenses of that sale are reported in the month of September on the income statement, which would be things like commission expense, wage expense, uh, advertising expense, right? These are all the parts of, we, we call these gen general selling administrative expenses. And those show up on the income statement as an expense related to the period in which they were sold, the product was sold. And they never appear on the balance sheet, you know, because they're expenses. So uh, ways of thinking about it is the purpose of financial statements uh, as they relate to product costs, period costs, is to help management to understand how revenue is generated. The idea of revenue being generated is through selling a good or a service. In our example, we're selling products, right? So we have product costs and period costs. Product costs go to the balance sheet as inventory and do cost of goods sold on the income statement. As I had said earlier, when we sell a product, it comes out of finished goods inventory on the balance sheet and into the income statement as a form of cost of goods sold. That is why we see product costs going to both, right? Period costs simply go to the income statement as selling, really should say general selling administrative expenses. So those are costs and those costs are uh, all about the costs of manufacturing costs of goods sold. Now let's take a look at a process, a system, if you will. This system is called the job order cost system. The job order cost system tracks costs associated with the manufacturing process as it relates to a job, okay? A job, think of it this way, a job for a manufacturer represents a sale, a, a, a purchase order from a customer, okay? Let's say, let's say you're the, you sell guitars and you need to purchase more guitars to sell in your guitar store, okay? So you would submit a purchase order to the guitar manufacturer. The guitar manufacturer takes your purchase order as a sales order, and puts it into what we call a job order cost system that represents that sale to the customer. And, or it could be batches of products that we're making in order to be sold. But typically it's, it's already a sale, right? So, so the manufacturer receives the sales order from the customer. The manufacturer puts that sales order into a job order in order to make the number of units being sold to the customer. The manufacturers use the job order cost system to uh, kind of simplify their process. Example of uh, job shops include things like apparel manufacturers and guitar manufacturers. And obviously our company is a guitar manufacturer. So that's the job order cost system. 
There's a separate system, which we'll get into more next week. Uh, it's called a process cost system. In manufacturing, uh, there are two different types of manufacturers, okay? There are job manufacturers and there are process manufacturers, job manufacturers and process manufacturers. Job manufacturers, as we had just talked about, are focused on completing customer orders through what this is called jobs. Process manufacturers are manufacturers that are continually processing materials. Examples of this would be oil refinery, paper producers, chemical processors, food processors. It's continuous. They're, it continues without stopping, okay? That is what we call a process. It continues without stopping. Uh, they don't make batches. They just continually manufacture. Now, you'll notice uh, oil refineries, for example, they continually pump the oil out of the ground and refine it into things like gasoline or heating oil or whatever, right? And uh, through that process, uh, it's continuous, right? They don't stop. It's, it's a continuous flow, okay? Uh, that is a process cost system. And we'll get more into that, uh, as I had said next week, but I do want you to understand it because uh, I want you to understand uh, uh, now instead of next week, because it's important to understand the difference between a job order cost system and a process order cost system. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at uh, things graphically. This, this, graph, this graphic is, um, it's okay. It's not the best graphic I have, but it, it, it gets my point across. So uh, in inventory, there are three types of inventory on the, on, the, on the balance sheet. On the balance sheet, there are three different types of inventory. We have raw materials inventory, work in process inventory, and finished goods inventory. Finished goods inventory is the inventory that's ready for sale. It's available for sale to our customers or to anyone who wants to buy them, right? Raw materials inventory very simply put, are the raw materials that I have ready for use in the manufacturing process. Work and process inventory is the inventory that is sitting in the, on the assembly line and is in process. That's why I call it work and process. These are all considered to be inventory because they are all assets. They all have value. My raw materials has a value. My work and process it has a value. My finished goods has a value. They're all inventory because I can quickly convert these uh, into a finished good and they have them sold. Therefore, they're all inventory. And so those are the three categories of inventory, raw materials, work in process, finished goods. Raw, raw materials is what we call direct material that is a prime cost. Uh, work in process, um, is a part of direct labor because the individuals completing the work are directly involved in the manufacturing process. We call that direct labor. Direct labor is both a prime cost and a conversion cost. Finished goods uh, simply hangs out in our uh, inventory. Factory overhead is a part of conversion cost. So this kind of helps to, su helps to summarize things in a nice graphical way. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the job order cost system because that is what we're, we're talking about this week. The job order cost system is a uh, system that helps us to, man to, to manage records, uh, which are cost by jobs. There are jobs, you know, customer orders that we have in the production process. Those are part of work and process. We have jobs that are completed and those are part of finished goods because you know, they, they finished the job, as they say, and those goods are ready to be sold to our customers. And we also have uh, jobs that have come in and um, they're, when they're sold, they become part of finished goods, or I'm sorry, cost of goods sold. 
So think of the physical flow of manufacturing. Think of the physical flow of materials as it goes through the process. We have raw materials that are in a storeroom. Uh, when a customer order comes in, we go into the storeroom. You know, when a job order comes in, we go into the storeroom and we select the quantity of raw materials that we need uh, to manufacture the finished good. And so we take that materials out of the storeroom and we put it into work in process. And we've, we've complete the work in process by applying direct labor and factory overhead to the raw materials to, to create a finished good. And then once the uh, finished good is completed in the work in process stage, we move it out of work in process and put it into finished goods inventory, which is in our warehouse. And then once the customer um, purchases the finished goods, we take it out of our warehouse, ship it to our customer, and that's when it becomes cost of goods sold on our income statement. And this process is, is cyclical. It, it's continuous. Uh, well, it's not continuous. It's, it's cyclical, though. So, so as we can see from this visual representation, we have uh, four jobs that are, are in this graphic. We have job number 69, 70, 71, 72. Jobs number 69 and 70 have been completed already by uh, the, our team in the uh, production process, and they're waiting to be sold to our customer. Jobs number 71 and 72 are currently in the work and process stage. They are being manufactured at this point in time. So it becomes a job when the customer order comes in. That's when it comes out of materials inventory and goes into work and process. So just so you understand that, that concept. In job order account, uh, in job order accounting, we use what we call the perpetual inventory system, which hopefully you remember from accounting 220. Perpetual inventory. Perpetual inventory uh, means we are continually tracking our inventory as it moves through the process. Okay, so think of like a barcode scanner, right? So, so let's say you, you go to the grocery store and you, you go to pick up um, a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread, okay? Uh, there's a process that it took for the gallon of milk and the loaf of bread to get to the grocery store. So the grocery store uh, orders the loaf of bread and the gallon of milk from their distributor. They receive it. They scan it into their finished goods inventory, right? And uh, you, the customer, cut you come in, you purchase it. When you purchase it, uh, it hits the conveyor belt. It goes over the barcode reader. The cashier cashes you out. Once the uh, inventory hits that barcode reader, it's, taking, it's taken out of inventory and put into cost of goods sold for the grocery store. And so that is a continuous process or a, it's continuous inventory. Therefore, it is perpetual. The word perpetual means continual. And uh, it goes in, it goes out. And every time it goes in and out, it is being scanned, right? It's perpetual. It means it's continuously counting. So let's take a look at each job and what that job represents. I had, earlier, I'd said a job represents a customer order, right? That is a job for a manufacturer. And there is a process the job goes through, as I had described earlier. We take raw materials out of raw materials, put it into work and process, take it out of work and process, put it into finished goods. The job order follows that process. The minute the customer order comes in, it becomes a job order. That job order keeps track of the raw materials being used, the hours being used in the uh, direct labor, the factory overhead being applied to each job, and then ultimately becomes finished goods. So think of a, um, a job order as a control process. It's a control, um, it's a ledger, right? It's like a ledger. But, but yeah, think of a job order as, as um, tailing all of the costs associated with that job 
on one sheet. Yeah. So let's let's take an uh, even deeper look at, at this process. So first we'll look at materials inventory, then we'll look at work in process inventory, and then finished goods inventory. Materials. Uh, raw materials, e each classification of raw material has this thing called materials ledger. Okay. Uh, just, just like we've learned with any other asset account to increase your asset, which in this case, raw materials inventory, we debit to increase and we credit to decrease. Remember it's raw materials is a, is an S uh, is a current asset account under inventory. So we debit to increase it and we credit to decrease it. When we are increasing raw materials, we are receiving it from our supplier. And when we're decreasing raw materials, we are taking it out of raw materials and putting it into work in process based off of requisition forms. So think of the uh, flow. This is the, a nice little flow chart, right? Uh, in, in this example, we are uh, purchasing additional units uh, in letter in letter A, we're we're pur purchasing additional quantities of raw materials. So we send uh, our supplier a purchase order. So the supplier fills that purchase order, and uh, when we receive our raw materials, we put it into our raw materials inventory. How do we do that? It is through the receiving process. We debit our raw materials inventory. Uh, based off of the classification of what it is. So in this example, it's it's maple wood that's being used in the guitar. And so I would debit my maple wood uh, raw materials inventory account uh, by the amount that it is coming in. So we can see we have quantity and an amount. And so that quantity amount is debited onto my raw materials um, inventory account for maple wood. Now in letter B, that, which is uh, a, a separate transaction, we are taking our raw materials out of raw materials and putting it into work in process because a customer order, a job order came in and the job order requires the use of that raw material of maple wood. So in letter B, job numbers, we, we actually we have two jobs that came in. We have job numbers uh, 71 and 72. Job number 71, we're going to utilize uh, $2,000 worth of maple wood. So 200 uh, pieces of lumber at $10 a piece of maple wood uh, equals $2,000. Job number 72, I have uh, 400 and 500 quantities being used in job number 72. And so... Uh, I, have, I took my raw materials out. Now I'm going to add in direct labor and factory overhead into that process. Because now we're in work in process. And I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. So when I am requisitioning, the word requisition simply means the uh, work in process department is requisitioning. They are requesting to receive raw materials for a specific job. It's called a requisition form. Uh, but before all that happens, when, when, uh, when the company receives their, the wood from the suppliers, there's this thing called a receiving report. A receiving report helps the company to identify the quality that the wood is being received in, the quantity, um, the, and verifying that everything's been expect, inspected and is in good condition. That's, that's all on the receiving report. Now, when we receive our raw materials from our vendor, we debit raw materials inventory and we credit accounts payable, assuming that we haven't paid them right away. So debit raw materials to increase your raw materials, which is an asset account. We credit accounts payable, which is a liability account. As you recall, accounts payable, of course, is when we have received the invoice from our vendor and have not yet paid it. 
The materials requisition form, as I had earlier described, is a release of the stored raw materials to the work and process department. We do that through what we call a materials requisition form. And all of the direct materials uh, are tracked on the job order cost sheets that make up the work in work and process. And uh, so let's, let's take a look at the requisition. Uh, yeah, let's look, take a look at the requisition process. So uh, we have a job order that came in from a customer and we need to utilize the raw materials in the work and process department to manufacture the, the guitars, right? So what we do to take it out of raw materials and put it work into work and process is we debit work and process inventory and credit raw materials inventory. So we're just basically taking it out of raw materials, putting it to work and process. They're both inventory accounts. And um, so therefore there will be a, a net zero change on the, on the um, accounting equation. So debit work and process, credit raw materials, take it out of raw materials, put it into work and process. So that's raw materials. Now, as we had discussed earlier, the total cost of a finished good includes direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. Now let's talk about the direct labor or the labor in general, I guess. So uh, individuals that are direct labor, well, most individuals, <laughs> we, we do this thing called time tickets. Time tickets are used to track the amount of time that an, uh, individual employees are working on a specific job. And what this does is it helps us to allocate the correct amount of labor for each job. We do that through the process of time tracking. Uh, for those of you who have ever worked um, in um, a, an environment where you're an hourly employee, you punch in when you arrive to work, you punch out for lunch, you punch back in, then you punch out when it's time to go home. That is that through that process of punching in and out, that is how your employer tracks your hours of work, which eventually shows up on your paycheck. So, uh, but in a similar process, we do that for each job, right? And so what that represents is the amount of time worked on each job. So here we have an example for job 71 and 72. On job 71, I have a couple of, uh, I have four, one, two, three, five employees on job number 71. Uh, and for example, this first employee here uh, on, on the time ticket, they worked a total of six hours on that particular job. Now, of course, there were other employees as well. And so we add up all of those employees' total hours for each job and allocate that to the direct labor for that job. So on job number 71, our example is we have $3,500 of total direct labor associated with that job. Okay, uh, which it comes from 350 total hours at an average hourly rate of $10 per hour. Uh, okay, so we have direct labor, uh, 3,500. Before that, we had direct materials, 2,000. And it looks like we're making 20 guitars for that particular job, for that customer. Job number 72, similar process. We add up all of our uh, direct labor, 500 hours at $15 per hour, 7,500. 7,500 is our total direct labor for job number 72. So you can see that the job, the job order process tracks all of these expenses as it relates to each customer order or each job order. So looking at the summary for the tickets, how do we, um, how, what's the journal entry for, the, for this, uh, for direct labor? We debit, work in process, and we credit wages payable. The reason why we debit work in process to allocate direct labor is because we need to increase the total uh, 
the total cost of work in process. How do we do that? We debit work in process to increase that, um, that cost of the inventory in work in process, right? And we credit wages payable because we need to eventually pay our employees that worked on those jobs, or worked on that job. So we talked about direct materials, we talked about direct labor, now let's look at factory overhead. When we allocate factory overhead to a job or a customer order, uh, we look at the costs that are not direct materials or direct labor, as we talked about earlier. So uh, what we do is we, uh, we, we, we summation things like um, uh, supervisor salaries, uh, janitorial wages, utility uh, bills for factory power, depreciation, so forth and so on. Uh, so in that process, there's a couple of methods that we use to allocate factory overhead. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how we allocate factory overhead. There are, the uh, one is through the um, single plant wide rate method. Another one is called the, um, all of a sudden I can't remember. So there's single plant wide rate method, there's a double, and then, oh, and then there's activity based costing. So uh, the allocation of factory overhead is done through this process called the cost allocation. Factory overhead costs are allocated based on jobs, uh, based off of common measures of each job. We call these activity bases, activity base. An activity base is typically measured with respect to hours, um, miles driven, hours uh, used, machine hours, labor hours, labor cost. These are all activity bases. It's a common measure associated with each job. Okay, so uh, there's predetermined factory overhead rate, which is one of the methods used for allocating factory overhead. The predetermined factory overhead rate is a, it's basically like a standard rate, okay? It's, it is predetermined. <laughs> we predetermine a factory overhead rate by taking our total factory overhead costs divided by the activity base. So looking at our example, we have an estimated total factory overhead cost for the year of $50,000. And we plan to utilize 10,000 direct labor hours for that year. That gives us $5 per direct labor hour in predetermined factory overhead rate. Using the activity-based costing method, we allocate factory overhead costs using different overhead rate options for factory overhead activities. The idea of activity-based costing is the base is the activity associated with the manufacturing process, like inspecting, moving, and machining. So uh, in our earlier example, using the predetermined factory overhead rate, it's $5 per direct labor hour. So I take my total direct labor hours for that job, multiply it by the $5 per direct labor hour of factory overhead to get $1,750 for job one, and $2,500 for job number 72. Now, of course, uh, throughout, to get your total work in process, we need to add up all of our jobs within the work in process stage. So in this case, we have $5 per direct labor hour of factory overhead rate that is predetermined. We take the direct labor hours for each job, multiply that by five to get the total for each job. Job 71 was 1,750, job 72 was 2,500. We add the two together to get $4,250 of uh, work in process. 
for factory overhead. So we need to, of course, increase our work in process amount. So we debit work in process 4,250. And we credit factory overhead 4,250. Applying factors to the factory overhead account to increase your factory overhead, uh, factory overhead uh, costs, we debit. To decrease, we credit. And there's, oh, and I should always say this. With, when it comes to factory overhead, the vast majority of the time, it's an estimate of factory overhead costs. And the reason for that is because we, can, we cannot know the exact cost until it happens, right? Like, I, I, I don't know what my electric bill is going to be for September because September hasn't yet happened. So I need to estimate that. And so there's going to be a small difference between the actual and the estimate, estimated for factory overhead. And when that happens, we, we need to make an adjustment. We need to do an adjusting entry at the end of that accounting period in order to uh, allocate that difference in factory overhead between the actual and the estimate. And to do that, we use these accounts called the underapplied or overapplied factory overhead. And this absorbs the difference. And uh, uh, what was I going to say? So for underapplied, underapplied factory overhead simply means that my uh, total cost factory overhead came in above the estimated cost. And so I need to absorb that cost. And so the way to do that is I debit uh, the underapplied factory overhead and credit factory overhead. And I would do the opposite when it's overapplied. Think of it like an adjusting entry. So during the year, the balance of factory overhead accounts are carried forward and reported as deferred debit or credit on the monthly interim balance sheets. Remember, factory overhead. Uh, factory overhead is is a permanent account. So, as you recall, there are temporary accounts and permanent accounts in accounting. You learned this back in two twenty. Uh, a permanent account is on the balance sheet. The balance sheet accounts never go away. They, they do not um, go to zero. Okay, that just doesn't happen. Well, I guess once in a while, but the, the point being is that there's always a balance. That's why we call it the balance sheet. Uh, temporary accounts are your accounts on your income statement. Those get zeroed out at the end of each accounting term or at end of each accounting uh, period. For, like, for example, today's September 1st. I started this month with zero revenue and zero expenses because I went through the closing cycle, and things like that, right? And we do that with every accounting term. But the, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is overhead is a permanent account. Okay. So at, at the end of each accounting year, I do need to transfer these uh, over, over and under, over, oh, that's funny. I need to transfer the factory overhead to my uh, cost of goods sold because the, uh, you know, and this happens, of course, when there's a difference, right? The, the difference needs to be applied to cost of goods sold because the overhead is associated with the total cost of the product sold. And so when there's an over, over application or under application, I need to transfer that from the balance sheet to the cost of goods sold to accurately reflect the total cost of goods sold. Again, through adjusting entries. So if it's under applied, we debit cost of goods sold and credit factory overhead. And we do the, uh, we do the opposite when it's, when it's over applied. So work in process. Work in process is increased through direct materials, direct labor, and applied factory overhead. Job order cost sheets. Uh, as we, we went through the process together, we talked about direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead, how each of those are applied to each job. 
And uh, as, as you would expect, each account, as you recall, each account has a general ledger and that general ledger has a subsidiary ledger and those subsidiary ledgers represent a, um, a total balance. Because as you know, with that, anything on the balance sheet, there is a, always a running total. Finished goods has their own general ledger. Finished goods includes information like the, the cost of goods manufactured, cost of units sold, and the cost for uh, units on hand. So what about sales? As we, uh, as we sell our inventory, um, we of course represent that through the, the sales process. So we would, we would debit either cash or accounts receivable if we sold it on account and we would credit sales. As you know, anytime that we sell a product, there is a cost of goods sold associated with that product. So the second transaction, we would, would be debit cost of goods sold and credit finished goods inventory. This, what that does, of course, is it removes it from our inventory and puts it onto our, our income statement. Earlier, we had discussed the uh, concept of selling administrative expenses through what we call period costs. Period costs are costs associated with that accounting period. Uh, as a use of generating revenue. It's not directly involved in the manufacturing process. However, it is a part of the sales process. So we, we have selling administrative expenses, which are recorded on the income statement as expenses. So as products are sold, we uh, incur the related selling administrative expenses on the income statement. To do that, we debit our expenses and credit any type of payables. So in, in this example, we have sales salaries and office salaries. So we debit uh, each of those expenses and credit total salaries payable. Here's an example of our income statement. We have sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit minus selling administrative expenses equals operating income. And then we would subtract all, all of our other expenses to get to net income. So in summation, the job or cost system uh, is very efficient, you know, that's, that, especially when it comes to tracking the total cost for each job. That's why we call it the job or cost system. This system can also be used for service businesses, like for like a dentist or um, an attorney or uh, advertising agency or a doctor. And the reason why they can use this job order cost system is because we, uh, we, they treat each customer as the job. And of course there's costs associated with that. And so they would add up like materials used on the customer, like, like a lawyer would use, uh, you know, pages printed, hours worked, um, office overhead, right? Those, those, those are the concepts associated with, uh, with a service business. So it's a little bit different, but the, the concept is the same. In decision-making, we look at job order cost systems to better understand our total costs, how they're traced, and how those total costs affect the business. And of course, we can compare jobs to each other uh, and it helps, it helps management to better understand the cost and uh, as it relates to changes in raw materials uh, or changes in, in labor cost per hour, things like that. Also helps management get better, better deals on things like raw materials and negotiate better, um, better contracts with their employees. Okay, uh, Ashley, I appreciate you joining me. Um, I hope I didn't bore you to death. Did you have any questions, comments, or concerns that I can help to answer at this time? Yeah. No, you didn't bore me. This, like I said, the first week was really helpful. I wasn't able to join last week and I watched the video, but it's still nice to have these sessions. So, yeah. 
I'm good. Thank you. Awesome. Very cool. I, and I, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to join me at, uh, you know, I, I know, I know it's busy, it's busy times. So, um, so, so yeah, if you have any comments, questions or concerns, you need help with anything, please let me know. I'm always around, always available to help. Uh, I hope that this session has been helpful. I hope that to continue to do these sessions each week on Wednesday at five o'clock thereabouts, there might be one or two that we might miss, but if that does happen, I'll make sure to post a recording instead. Uh, I will post uh, the PowerPoint presentation and the recording to the discussion board area as I normally do. And as always, please stay safe, wash your hands, do the right things, and hope to see you again next time. And thank you so much, Ashley. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much. Stay safe. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.